everybody. Welcome to Psychology Online once again. You know, this is kind of weird for me. When I was about five years old, my mom had a radio show. And I used to go to the studio with her while she would put on her show. And it was live. It was on the air. And I remember everything had to be really quiet. You know, I had to sit there like a little mouse while she did a radio show. And that's sort of the way it is around here when I'm recording. We try to keep the door closed and the cats out and one thing and the other. But I know you hear a little bit of background noise once in a while. So just ignore it. Okay. I also know that these slides or these presentations get long when you're just listening. You've already got your slides with you. You know, you can put me on pause. I won't know the difference. I won't know that you're bored with me and are going to shut me out. So that's just fine. Take your time. Stop and go back and look at the slides. Do what you need to do. Email me any questions you have. Jot them down. Send me an email and I will try to get to everything, uh, at least in the day that you send it. I always check it before I go to bed at night, okay? Uh, I'm going to be sending you more emails. I'll be sending you kind of a revised calendar. Uh, I went to all the work to do the one that I sent you, and of course then it went up in the air. That doesn't work anymore, right? And uh, uh, an information on how we're going to do the test, that kind of thing. So keep an eye on your emails. I know they're sometimes chatty and a little bit long, but that's okay. You'll get used to it. Okay. So I am going to shoot for exam dates for the Unit 3 and Unit 4 of April the 9th and April the 28th. On those days that will be our exam dates, I will be available here at the house with my computer turned on during our normal test time. And during that time, if you have a question on it, you can just shoot me an email and I'll get right back to you. Uh, there's going to be some freedom on time frames to do the exam, so I will check my emails during the day and get back to you with anything that you have a question on. All right. Thank you for hanging in there. I know this is just uncomfortable for everybody, but if everyone you know is well and healthy and nobody's having to plan a funeral, that's good. That's good. We have no reason to whine, and I know it's tough. Uh, you know, give me a shout if you need to chat about anything. All right. See you guys soon. Bye for now. Personality. I find this chapter to be uh, especially interesting because, well, we all have one no matter what it's like, and everybody we know has one. So it gives us a real opportunity to apply what we learn in this chapter to the world around us, maybe have some deeper thoughts about it. When we look at personality, what we're thinking about is being relatively consistent in our thinking, in our head, in our feeling, we usually give that to our heart to take care of, and our behavior. Now, you and I both know that there's a lot of conflict many times between what we think and what we feel. I think I shouldn't have that great big piece of chocolate cake with all that icing because I'm trying to lose weight. My feelings say, I better go get a glass of milk to have with that because it's going to taste a lot better that way. So what we have here is this situation that becomes very complex between what we want and what the world wants us to want. We're going to look at theories. Theories are not proof. Theories do not have significant research behind them that proves cause and effect. So they are theories. What we've done here is I've roughly grouped these into four categories. Each of these tries to explain, in the, based on their own psychological theories, what are the similarities and differences in people and how do you get to be who you are? Where does that personality come from? The first of these perspectives is the psychoanalytical. And we'll look at a number of theorists with this. The one that's the most known to the world is Sigmund Freud. And we'll spend quite a bit of time with Freud. He's the one we all know has sex and aggression. But those people that studied with him and came after after him that are psychoanalytic also are students of his, also hold on to the same concept, but with different causes. So we'll look at them at great length. With the humanistic perspective, which is one that I love and has made a big difference in my life, we're going to hear the terms the fully functioning person and self-actualization, free will, self-determination, ability to change and grow over the lifetime. It's pretty positive, although not, again, not proven. When we look at the social cognitive perspective, which we've looked at before, social means the society around us, cognitive has to do with our thinking process. And we're going to come to a term called reciprocal.
reciprocal determinism, meaning that what happens is a play between what we want to do and what society wants us to do, what we think, what we feel, and how we are positively or negative reinforced or punished. With number four, trait perspective, and hopefully you've done your PF16 or your Myers-Briggs and sent it in to me, what trait theory really looks at is the differences between people, the traits they have, and we're going to get into genetics and environment again. We're going to look at twin studies because different people uh, people come from different kinds of environments, but even when they come from the very same type of environment, many times they're thinking and their feeling and their behavior is entirely different. So the first thing we're going to look at is the psychoanalytic perspective of personality. Psychoanalysis, the term, is not only a theory of how we become who we are and why we do the things we do, but psychoanalysis, which sounds very similar, is a therapeutic process that Freud used. You've seen cartoons or pictures of the famous chaise lounge and Freud sitting there with his pencil and pen and the client is is reclining on the chaise lounge talking about their dreams or whatever. So it's a theory as well as a practice. When we look at Freud, he's going to give us a concept that's never really been used before He's going to give us this idea of this unconscious determinants that we have and the enduring effects of childhood. People didn't really think about having an unconscious before, but we touched on this briefly in chapter number one. But let's talk about Sigmund for just a minute himself. First of all, he was really, 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 really negative. For him, the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and it was a downhill ride, and it was fast. Think about the world he lived in. He was Austrian. He was a Jew. Oh my God, the hated Jews. They were discriminated against way before the Holocaust. They've always been discriminated against. Lots and lots of prejudice. It would be like being African American and living in Alabama back in the 20th century. It was it was not a good place to be. He studied. He wanted to be a physiologist. It, that was a hard way to get a job. He had to develop. He finally developed a private practice in neurology. That was difficult. During his lifetime, he ended up moving to London in order to escape the oncoming Holocaust that was happening in Europe. He died in London. How sad for this man. He had a, he had six kids, I think, five or six kids, a wife to support, all of those kinds of things. So he had a very, very difficult life to have to deal with. The influence of Freud's ideas. Well, we can't underplay the influence of Freud. First of all, he is the most frequently or the most easily recognized name around the world in the field of psychology. So he was famous, famous later, not so famous at the time. He might have been infamous because he talked about sex and aggression, which coming out of the Victorian era, we just didn't talk about sex. Well, he had this friend that was a physician as well, and his friend's name was Joseph Brewer. Brewer, had was a physician and he had turned his sights toward psychology as well and he used a lot of hypnosis and in hypnosis he wanted his clients to be able to remember traumas and memories and emotions and feelings they had had and he believed that if you could pull these back up and talk about them that it would create something called catharsis catharsis was you would get better. You wouldn't be as affected by these negative things that had been buried inside of you. And he used hypnosis to do this. Well, Freud wasn't so thrilled about hypnosis. He used a theory called free association, where you could report uncensored memories and thoughts spontaneously. Now, when we think of free association, we might think of the old word game where I say cat and you say tree and I say flower, and you say springtime. But what if I said penis? I do this in class if we're actually meeting in class, and everybody turns a slight shade of red. Typically, I will get somebody that will say vagina. But there are other options to it, and there are standard answers to these kinds of things. So you might even play this game with people, but you would go in and talk and talk and talk and talk, just like I'm doing now, and Freud would sit there and take notes. And later, he would analyze these notes. He wanted particularly to talk about your dreams. 
or you to talk about your dreams. Now, remember all these stressors that have happened in your life, all of these memories, all of these traumas, you've buried these deep in your mind through the process of repression. And Freud wants them to come back up so he can analyze them and then tell you why you're so screwed up now. He really believed, this was his theory, that there was this conflict between what you'd experienced in life and what you naturally wanted in life. And we'll look at that later in more detail. He loved dreams so much that in 1900, he wrote this book called The Interpretation of Dreams. I had a student last semester that wanted to know if they could read that as an extra credit book. And I had to laugh. I said, I can't even read that book. It's so thick and so deep. And no, you can't. But there's certainly a lot of dream books in magazines and on bookshelves at Barnes and Noble and on Amazon if you're interested in interpreting your dreams. In 1895, five years before he published the dream book, he wrote a book called Studies of Hysteria. And we think of hysteria as being somebody running on and on and on, and we get to slap them, you know, to bring them back to themselves. But hysteria was a word they used at the time to indicate when someone was not reacting appropriately, what we would think with good mental health. And this book really marked the beginning of psychoanalysis when he came out with this book in 1905. He also wrote a book, Civilization and Its Discontent. He wrote a lot of books. He basically, he published and taught and refined his theories for over 30 years. And I find this fascinating because he didn't have much foundation to put all of this on. He just kind of dreamed it up himself and pulled it out of his hat, so to speak. Freud's dynamic theory of personality. Freud says we have three levels of consciousness, and I think you would agree with this. He says that our personality, though, is the conflict that occurs between these three forces. We have a conscious level. We're aware of what's going on right this minute. We have a pre-conscious level. These are things that you can bring up easily. If you're not thinking about Christmas right now, I don't imagine. But if I said to you, where did you spend Christmas this last year? You could pull that up in your memory and tell me. It's there ready to be opened up and looked at again. You're not thinking about where you graduated from high school. But if I say, tell me about your high school graduation, you're going to tell me which school you came from. So that's your pre-conscious. Your unconscious level is that level that you are unaware of. Where did that level come from? Why do you do the things you do? Why do I do the things I do? Unconsciously, I'm pushed and pulled by my experiences in life as well probably as the expectations that I think society has for me. So we have these patterns we've developed. We've been rewarded. We've been punished. We've been in emotional situations that have left us cynical and scarred and burned. We've been in situations as a child where we were unsure why we were punished or rewarded for the things that we did. Throughout our life, there are all of these conflicts. And sometimes, even when something bad happens, and we don't want to remember it that way, we paint over it with a paintbrush of, this wasn't so bad after all. But it can still affect us in our unconscious to feel that we've been rejected or punished or whatever those negative things are that, that you experience. Well, we just have a picture on this slide of our famous iceberg. You will see the iceberg in almost any psychology book you look to that's going to be talking about Freud. On the left side of this slide, we see the levels of awareness that we just talked about, the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious. What we see with this, though, is also the id, the ego, and the superego. You've heard these terms before. You could hardly live in society without hearing these terms, but I want to talk about what they mean for just a moment and look at them. If you look into the conscious area, the part above the waterline, you have a little bit of superego and a little bit of ego, but your id is completely hidden down there in the unconscious part of your mind. When we look at these, what we want to do is think about who and what they are. Your id is that part of you that you're born with. It's maybe your temperament. It's the pleasure principle. I want it now. I want it now. I want my bottle now. I want my nap now. I want to cry now. I want to poop now. And we take this id with us 
all of our life, and it controls a lot of things. Many times when we do things that are stupid things to do, it's because our id says, I want it, and I want it now. On the other hand, we have the superego. And the superego is society's rules and regulations. Superego says, you do this, you don't do that. If you do this, you'll be rewarded. If you do that, you'll be punished. And then we look at the ego. The ego is not like you're so vain, the old song. Ego is your sense of self. Somehow, as you balance out the desires of the id, I want it, I want it, and the superego, no, no, you must be nice. The little ego in the middle has to negotiate this. It has to rationalize why it's going to do what it's doing. It's like being pushed and pulled, pushed and pulled, pushed and pulled. And there you are, ego, in the middle, trying to keep afloat of how you're going to deal with all of these expectations that are on you, as well as what you want. So let's let's pop back for a minute to dream analysis, because Freud believed this is how we got to all of that material that's down there in your unconscious mind. He says that when we dream, these unconscious materials float up to the top in sort of a distorted and symbolic way. And he wrote books about dreams and what each of these symbols meant. Now, in a way, this is like looking at an old black and white French movie, which you've probably never seen. But many romances in old French movies occurred on trains. And as they went to a shot of the train going into a tunnel, this was very symbolic for the people were involved in a physical relationship. This was, they were having sex, the train going into the dark tunnel. I'm sure you can see how they got to this. So there's many other concepts as well, other symbols that Freud's going to say he knows specifically what they mean. But he said, in your dream, you have two kinds of content. You have manifest and latent content. Manifest content is what you see. I had a dream last night. My dream had an old rock and roll song in it. And I was in a restaurant. A person getting their napkin and silverware across from me, they were humming along to the old song too. And suddenly this strange person in the restaurant asked me if I wanted to dance to the old rock and roll song. What the devil does that mean? I have no idea. I do like to dance, and I did like the song back in the day. The, the whole dream is just, is just bizarre to me. But I might be able to go to Freud and talk about this, and he would go, aha, she's thinking about blah, blah, blah. So that's the manifest content, what we see on the surface. The latent content is what Freud's going to come up with. His analysis is going to say, this is the latent content. This is what the true, hidden, unconscious meaning of that is. Well, good luck, Freud, because I have some really strange dreams. He also says that these unintentional, unconscious traumas and dramas that we have in our life, these anxieties, bring about behaviors that while we think they are unconscious they and unintentional, they point out different things that we've done. He calls them Freudian slips. If you fall down and break a leg, Freud's going to say, that's not an accident. You probably need to be taken care of. If you make a mistake, Freud's going to say, why did you do that? Did you want attention? If you forget something, Freud's going to say, aha, you didn't want to remember it. And then the famous Freudian slips, the slip of the tongue, where you say something entirely different than what you meant to say. There's a, an old Freud joke, and I put joke in quotation marks, where the couple's at the therapist and the husband says, well, at breakfast, I meant to say, pass the salt, dear. But instead, I said, you've ruined my life, you miserable bitch. Now, that might be a little extreme, but it is kind of funny to those of us who've studied Freud. So let's look a little bit at this psychodynamic structure of personality. First of all, we have the id. Now, the id is unconscious, totally unconscious. It's present at birth. It's immune to logic. It's immune to values. It's immune to morals. It's immune to danger. It's immune to the rules of society. It strictly works on the pleasure principle and it wants what it wants, what it wants. And sex and aggression are the two primary forces within this id. These conflicting drives of life and death, eros and thanatos. Eros is that hunger, 
thirst, you know, survival kinds of things, comfort. And the libido is in there as well, sexual energy, sexual motivation. In other words, keep humanity moving on and creating. Don't let us just die off like the developers have come in and ruined our habitat. And thanatos is that destructive, aggressive, as well as reckless part of our personality. I've never quite understood why people want to go bungee jump off of a tall bridge. That just seems stupid to me. Or take risks that have have good odds for killing them. That's just not my way of thinking. I've seen research that says it's different enzymes in our bodies. It's different ways that we work. But it just seems to be in some people, if they are not taking an unusual, dangerous risk, they're not happy. And then there's those people that want what they want, what they want when they want it. We see this with little kids. We see it with tantrums in the floor and all those kinds of things. But the truth of the matter is most of us learn to deal with these drives of the id, tampering them down with the superego, the superego, those social rules that keep it from happening. Perpetuating humanity, that's a good thing to have as a basic drive. Well, our ego, our sense of self, okay, part of it's conscious. It's almost like our frontal lobe because it's organized and rational. We can plan with it. We understand what's going on. It's very similar to what we looked at as the functions of the frontal lobe. And its job is to mediate between the id, I want it, I want it, and the world, the superego. No, no, don't do that. That's bad. The ego messes around with the reality principle, and it gives us the opportunity to postpone gratification. I want it now, but I can't afford it now. I want it now, but it's not the time to do it. I would love to have a big spring party. That's what I want. I want to be outside in the sunshine and see the flowers and enjoy spring. But we're in a situation right now where everybody's hunkered down at home because we don't want a virus. So I'm postponing this desire I have, my I want, I want to hang out with friends, drink wine and see the flowers bloom once we're all a bit healthier. It's pragmatic. Pragmatic means sensible. It means even though I don't like it, I'm going to do it because it's going to work best in the long run. And we learn we learn to compromise. We learn to reduce this tension between what we should do and what we want to do through this pragmatic mediating ego that we have. What happens if the ego can't come up with a good excuse for this postponing of, of pleasure, of being pragmatic? Freud says that if the ego can't find a suitable compromise, what we do is we repress it or deny it. We take it out of our conscious mind and we just don't think about it. In some cases, I don't really believe in repression, but we'll get to that later. But in some cases, we absolutely forget that it's there. We say, well, I don't remember that. I don't think I did that. Or, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that they don't really have the flu. I'm sure they're not really going to die. We just go into denial because we don't know how to fix it. We don't know how to balance it out. We don't know how to get from what we want to what we need to do. So in this Freud says that we are going to develop something called ego defense mechanisms. We'll come back to those. Let's look again at the superego and just make sure that we are clear on what it does. The social values that exist in our society, which doesn't mean to say that they exist in other societies, become internalized in us. We know what it is to live comfortably in society without too much judgment or too many traffic tickets or too much getting fired or too much people thinking we're weird. This all starts very, very early when we're just babies and we get picked up because we cried and we get put down because we're full and sleepy. We're reinforced or we're punished. By the time we are five or six, Freud says that we have internalized this into our part conscious voice until we have developed a parental voice on the inside. I'm an adult, an adult for a long time. And sometimes in my life, when I do something that I know my mother wouldn't like, it's as though I can hear her voice in my head making that, now, now, you shouldn't have done that look and sound. That's weird. She's been dead for 20 years, and I can still hear her. But whether I could hear her voice or not, 
doesn't mean that that message wouldn't still be there. This age of five or six, Roy's going to say by this time, by the time we turn six, our personality, the foundation of it is formed and it's going to stay formed. And this superego is going to evaluate for us what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And we learn it through our society and our parents are part of society where we go to church, synagogue, or mosque, a part of society, aunts, uncles, what we see on television, all part of society. This is reinforcing or punishing in the operant conditioning way. And it's so soaked to, into us by the time we're six that Freud's going to say we're a cooked cookie. Our personality foundation is formed. Well, poor little ego. There it is being pulled one way by the id and pulled the other way by the superego. And you know, we just want to hide out to tell you the truth. So what we do is we build these ego defense mechanisms. You have lists of these in your book. You can look them up online. There's lots of them. And Freud says this helps us put off making the big decisions or dealing with something that is causing anxiety in our life until we are better able to deal with it. They are temporary solutions and they are unconscious solutions. They're really not bad as long as you don't make a practice of living in this fantasy land where these things don't exist. You don't want to do that. That's unrealistic. But what you can do is you can take a break. It kind of gives you the opportunity to take a break as you unconsciously work on the problem and come to a workable solution for you in your conscious mind. Let's take a look at these unconscious deceptions. Repression. Repression. This is the most fundamental one, according to Freud, and I don't really believe in it, and I'm not the only mental health professional that doesn't believe in it. Freud says that we wall it up behind this big brick wall unconsciously, pretty much like an Edgar Allan Poe horror story. I don't know about you, but the worse something is, or the more times it happens, I think I'm going to be less likely to be able to wall it off. Something that happens once and goes by, no big deal. I can forget about that and not deal with it. But if something bad happens, something big happens, you know, you remember when your grandpa died. I remember 9-11. I remember when my house flooded and destroyed everything years ago. Bad things that happen, I'm not going to repress them. Now, suppression is a different thing. Suppression is the one where I just don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about my divorce. I don't want to talk about my grandpa dying. I don't want to talk about the time that I got fired from the job I loved, whatever it is for you. There are things we just don't want to talk about and remember because when we remember those things, causes the emotions that we had both emotionally and physiologically to reappear in us. And we don't want to feel that pain. Okay? So repression, but maybe Freud's right and I'm wrong. Then there's displacement. Displacement means that you are redirecting the emotions that you're having to someplace safe. I'll give you an example. You've had a really bad day at school. You got your results back on your exam and you didn't do as well as you wanted to do. You got a homework assignment that's going to take hours and hours of work and you think it's stupid and you don't want to do it either. And to top off the day, you had a big brawl of a fight with your significant other. You come home, you are you are ticked off, okay? You just want you want to hit something. You didn't have time to go to the gym and hit the bag or hit the track. So what do you do? You come home and you displace your frustration and your anger and you take it out on some place that's safe. Maybe you kick the dog. Maybe you throw the cat outside. Maybe you pick a fight with your parents or your significant other. Your parents can't fail you in school. Your parents can't fire you you from your job. So when you're frustrated and angry, I think there used to be an old song that says you always hurt the one you love. It should be called the displacement song because we come home and we take our frustration, our anger, all of those things out on someone that we know will still love us afterward, basically. That's displacement. Form of displacement is sublimation. When we go back and we're going to we're going to look in detail at the id. It has all this sexual energy built into it, as well as all this aggression. And the sex is both the libido, physical sex, as much as it is this underpinning of drive to keep civilization going. Well, some people don't have an outlet for the sexual drive. Maybe they just don't have a partner. 
Maybe they belong to a religious order that that expects celibacy. Maybe they are ill. Who knows why? But there's no outlet for this sexual energy. So what they do, according to Freud, is they have a defense mechanism that allows them to do things that are beneficial for society to use this sexual energy, this creative energy. So you see great painters, you see great chefs. In my case, you may see great gardeners. When I had a really unhappy marriage, and it was a very sterile marriage, to be honest with you, I gardened like crazy. I still garden, but it's not as obsessive as it used to be. So sublimation, you take this sexual energy and you put it into something that benefits society. If you look at many church organizations, you will see that they have outreach for the poor. They have boys clubs. They have girls clubs. They have all kinds of organizations where the priests or the the nuns work with those who don't have an, an opportunity to always help themselves. This is a form of displacement called sublimation. Now, denial. Oh, we use that term like we've all studied Freud. Denial is just not a river in Egypt. No, denial is... Just just not accepting that the reality is there. We talked about it briefly in the last chapter when we looked at Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, death and dying. That doc, you must be wrong. Uh, the lab's wrong. The blood work's wrong. The x-rays are wrong. I can't be that sick. I'm not dying. Denial is, it's amazing how it can protect or not protect people. And I'll give you an example. I had a friend who... I used to come into Kansas City frequently, and she would come and stay with me when she came. And one day when she was there, she was obviously upset. And so she starts telling me about the way her husband is acting. Now, they're in their 40s, I would say, uh, mid-40s. And he had hit her. He had hit her, and he had shoved her to the floor. And she ended up calling the police on him because he assaulted her. But then she tells me about other things he's done. He's gone to the gym, and he's gotten fit. And he goes to the tanning bed and he gets tan. And now he gets his hair styled instead of just running by the barbershop whenever he gets shaggy. Oh, and he bought a new car, a Chevy Corvette. Hmm, okay. And he has all these cool new clothes that he's buying, very, very trendy, very modern, including new underwear. No more old tidy whities Now he's got bikini cuts. So she said, I just don't know what's going on. Well, I suspect that you all know what's going on. He's in the middle of a midlife crisis in a big juicy affair. But I said to her in my best therapeutic manner, and friend manner. Do you think that there's a possibility that he has a romance on the side? Oh, no, she says, not John. John would never do that. (laughs) Well, three months later, guess what? She finds out that John is having an affair on the side. And of course, John is having some kind of a midlife crisis. It's like textbook stereotype. But she couldn't deal with it right then. She couldn't deal with the fact that her life was going to fall apart, that their children wouldn't be able to go to mom and dad's together for Christmas, that she wouldn't be able to rely on him to make decisions. It was just too painful for her to deal with. And quite honestly, she stopped contacting me. I think it was, I think it was embarrassing for her because suddenly she realized that I knew what was going on and she didn't. And I think it was an embarrassment for her. She's a very capable, very bright woman who just had this blind spot in her life. As I said before, sometimes these defense mechanisms can be kind of healthy. They can be a temporary hiatus from the things that we need to deal with and the stress involved. I'm sure that my friend dreamt about and unconsciously dealt with the fact that her marriage was probably going to fall apart. She just couldn't deal with it in a day-to-day situation when she had to get up in the morning and get on the airplane and go travel for business. It's only counterproductive, really, when we don't learn to cope with the situation. But it's okay to do it for a little while. Well, now we're going to get into the psychosexual stages another stage theory. And remember, we go through these, when we have a stage theory, we go through one step at a time. And the more completely we master one step, the better able we are to move up to the next step and deal with the anxieties and the tensions and the problems that occur 
the next time. Freud believed that these psychosexual stages occurred in everyone and that the first three of them work to develop our personality. The first three of them are covered by the time we are six years old. Now, in these stages, we can become what Freud called fixated, which is when the conflict that has developed is unresolved. We get fixated and we stick there. It's a developmental conflict. Does it keep us from moving to the next stage? Perhaps not, but it makes it more difficult to deal with the next stage. So the way we get fixated is our needs are either overmet or undermet when we are in this stage. We are either overindulged by our parents or neglected by our parents. So you can get fixated. Let's look at these. The first stage is the oral stage, and this is the first year of life. When we think about kids, you know, zero, you know, birth to one year, what do we think about? It's all about oral. It's give me my bottle, give me my thumb to suck, let me put the lint on the floor in my mouth, you know, uh, let me chew on the paper and the magazine. They are all about manipulating their world, and almost anything they touch is going to go into their mouth. Freud calls this the oral stage, and it seems logical and practical. Let me ask you a question, though. Do I have any nail biters, any gum chewers, any pencil chewers, anybody put their sunglasses in their mouth and chew on a piece of it, any smokers? All of these things that we have that are oral habits in adulthood, Freud is going to say these exist because... We did not complete the tasks of the oral stage in the first year of life. I used to smoke. Uh, I sometimes still chew gum. Uh, I used to eat the erasers off my pencils. I never chewed my nails or even more disgusting, my cuticles, but I've known a lot of people that do. And it's very hard to break these habits. Freud will say it's hard to break these habits because they meet a need in us that we're unaware of, going clear back to that first year of life. Well, the next stage is the anal stage. Anal is, is your, your pooper, right? And the next two years of life, for most of us, between the ages of turning one and turning three, is all about learning to be potty trained. Parents will just almost pray, please, God, let me survive this. Please, God, let me just live till this kid can use the toilet. It's what everything is about. We buy them books. Good girls use the potty. Bought that book for my granddaughter. We buy little treats for them. Oh, look, you're sitting on the potty chair. Here's some Cheerios. We make little charts with gold stars. We buy them. We let them go to the Target and shop for a present when they've gone in the potty five times. We do anything to get these kids house broke. <laughs> like a dog, okay? Uh, get them potty broke. It's And, and we see Parents who are harsh in this, parents will punish their children. They will slap their children. They will spank their children if they soil their diapers or their pants. They will reward them. It's bizarre what people do. Parents take great pride in, ooh, little Susie's already potty trained. Well, good luck. Girls potty train faster than boys do. Boys may be three and a half going on four years old, and they're still hiding behind the chair because it's just too much trouble to go to the bathroom and pull down their pants and, and use, uh, use the toilet. So this is a big deal. So Freud is going to say we get fixated in this stage. And some symptoms we might see having to do with being too overindulged or under overindulged are people that are either super, super tidy, clean OCD, or people that are just pigs, just pigs. Their room is a mess. Their house is a mess. Their kitchen has moldy food sitting around in the pans. Ooh, I'm thinking of my former sister-in-law. Gross. It can go either way. You either have to have everything so clean or everything is just a disaster. Collecting things. String. Rubber bands. Used aluminum foil. Some of this may come from your parents being poor or just habits in the family. But I know a woman that must have at least a hundred of those great big, I don't know what they hold, quart, half gallon beverage jugs that you used to be able to buy at the Quick Trip and the 7-Eleven. Now, I understand having more than one or two might be handy if you're one of those people that carries your water with you everywhere. But a hundred of them? 
She also keeps every butter tub and Cool Whip container, anything else that comes in a plastic lidded container, she keeps. She has a whole room dedicated to this hoarding of these plastic containers. Now, you can't tell me that something didn't go wrong back in that anal stage. She was one of 11 children, and I sus- there was a lot of emphasis put on learn to use the potty, because I think at some times, because of the age of her brothers and sisters, this poor mother must have had three kids in diapers at the same time. The one that just got born, the one that's a toddler, and the one that hasn't quite gotten it mastered yet. So I suspect it was pretty harsh. I from Things I've heard, her family was a physically pretty harsh family. So she's probably got that keeping everything, hoarding everything situation not under control. It probably came from this anal stage, and Freud would certainly say it does. And the third stage, oh goody, this is where Freud got in trouble with society and everybody was just, oh my God, oh my God. This is the phallic stage. And this is from the year when you're three going on four and four going on five. This this is going to take you up to age six when your personality foundation is formed. In case you don't know, phallus means penis. So this is the the penis stage. But we use the word phallus a lot. We talk about the Liberty Memorial downtown being a big phallic symbol. You know, anything that's long and tall and and hard is it gets teased into being the phallic stage. During the phallic stage, Freud says that unconsciously we develop a sexual drive toward our opposite sex parent. Now, don't freak out here. Yes, this sounds incestuous. Yes, it is incestuous according to our definitions of this, but it's totally unconscious. It's called the Oedipus Complex. It, it comes about because uh, it's named because of Oedipus, uh, and we need to turn to the next slide, the Oedipus Complex. So how does this psychosexual drama play out? First of all, let's take little, little Jimmy here. Little Jimmy, according to Freud, has a crush on mom. And if we look at the behavior of little boys four and five, this isn't hard to see. They want to be with mommy. They want to do everything mommy wants to do. If mommy and daddy sit down on the sofa together, you know, and want a little snuggle, the kid will come and get between them, push dad away. Mom belongs to him. Some little boys will even say, mommy, when I grow up, I'm going to marry you, not knowing what this really means in all of its meaning of marriage. So it has this crush on mom, we'll say. Now, how did this apply to Oedipus? Oedipus accidentally killed his father and then married his mother. So it was an incestuous relationship in old Greek mythology. So that's why it's called the Oedipus Complex. So how does this get resolved? The child, the little boy, is going to decide after a while that he's afraid of dad. Dad is big and powerful and has sharp power tools. What if dad finds out that little Jimmy has this crush on mom? Could dad possibly castrate him? So the child develops what Freud calls castration anxiety, fear that the father will come after the family jewels because of this crush that he has on mom. So the way this is resolved is little Jimmy identifies. That's the word we want is identification. He identifies with his father. He internalizes his father's values and attitudes. Now he wants to take his little toys and go outside and pretend like he's mowing grass with dad. He wants pretend tools so he can have a hammer and screwdriver maybe like dad has. If dad likes lots of books, he's going to want to read books too. He's going to become like dad. And part of this is, unconsciously, if he is like dad, then someday he can attract a woman like mom. Ooh, and you've all heard somewhere along the line, somebody says, well, you know, he just married his mother. You know, she's just like his mother. Why would he marry her? You know, just like his mother. It goes back to Freud, and they don't even know it goes back to Freud. Well, in this, going on with this, Freud's going to say that women develop penis envy. And this is called the Electra Complex. And and let me cover one more thing with this slide before we move to the Electra. And that's the next two stages, the latency and the genital stage. 
The latency stage is the repression of sexual drives. And this is typically elementary school age. When boys go play with boys, they play boy games, they get rough, they you know have cars and trucks and, and sports and all of that kind of thing. And they don't think about girls yet. When I was when I was a kid and, and my kids too, it was like the opposite sex had cooties. The worst thing you could possibly think about on a bad rainy day was your teacher taking everybody down to the gym and you would have to square hands and touch the opposite sex. Ew, yuck. Okay, so that's the repression of sexual drives. Well, number 5B on your slide, these incestuous urges get resolved when you're a teenager. Puberty comes along, suddenly these sexual drives, all these hormones start happening. You have internalized with your super ego the rules of society that says you don't have a crush on mom. So now you look outside of the family and perhaps you look for someone like mom because that's your role model for what loving and nurturing and all those things are. So the resolution comes through identification with the same sex parent. Let's move down to the Electra complex. Freud did not call it this. His colleague Carl Jung called it this because Freud wasn't big on women, even though that's who made up most of his his patient base. He really measured everything by men's standards and women were kind of the second sex, so to speak. So here's the Electra complex. It's the counterpart to the Oedipus complex. Freud considered women to be the second sex and to be somewhat of a degeneration from the norm that men were. But Freud did believe that we used pregnancy as a way to equalize our place in society with men and to make up for the fact that we didn't have a penis. It helped us gain status. Freud's going to say that, ladies, we have this resentment toward our mothers. We look down and we see that we don't have a penis. Here we are stuck with this little microscopic clitoris, so to speak. Okay, we don't have a nice big strong penis like our brothers and our dads do. And we have a phallocentric social system out there, especially in the time of Freud, where men ruled. Men had the jobs, men had the power, men had the money. They were the patriarchal leaders of our culture. But we looked in the mirror and we realized that mom did not save us from having our genitalia removed. She let us be castrated, so to speak. And we don't like her for this. And we develop an unconscious crush on dad. And just watch little girls. They're really funny. They learn to flirt by flirting with their dads. They dress up and get pretty, and the first person they want to show is their dad or their grandpa. Little girls are drawn toward men. Watch a child in in a high chair sitting in a restaurant. They will typically, little girls will pay more attention to men walking by than they will to women walking by. It's just the way it works. But like the boys got afraid of castration anxiety, we become afraid of what our mothers will do too. If they let this happen to us before we even knew it, my God, what are they capable of now if they find out that we've got a crush on dad? So we do the same thing. We start identifying with mom. Suddenly we want to learn to play in the kitchen and we have kitchen toys. Suddenly we want to wear nail polish like mom wears nail polish. We want to have our hair be pretty like mom in the hopes, long term and unconsciously, that we can snag a man like dad. Isn't that it? Well, you know, she married her father. Freud had this strange view about feminism and lesbianism. He believed that this resentment toward our fathers and this resentment toward, you know, women, bad sexual experiences, he really didn't didn't give much credit to the fact that we're born the way we're born when it comes to sexual drives. So he tried to look at this phallic stage and figure out, and also the puberty stage, why we might have same-sex attractions or why we might, as women, want to take over the world and rule. Gosh, have some power. That really makes us abnormal, doesn't it? All right, we're going to stop at this point. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Neo-Freudians. These are people that are still psychoanalytic. 
Many of them studied with Freud or the students of Freud. They still believe in this unconscious drive within us that causes us to be who we are, but they disagree with Freud about what these drives are. And it's really pretty interesting. There's a couple of them that I like very well. So especially when we look at Carl Jung, when we look at a woman whose last name is pronounced Horni, it's going to look like horny, but it's Horni. So we'll come back with that next time. Take care, look at your books, study your notes, have a great time, stay safe. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay, let's take a look now at the Neo-Freudians. These are the descendants and dissenters of Freud. They are still psychoanalytic. They still believe that there are unseen, unconscious forces that motivate us to do the things we do. But for the most part, they disagreed with Freud about it being sex and aggression. They had other motivators. They disagreed with him on sex and aggression. They did believe that early childhood was super important, but it wasn't the end all. Your personality was not basically formed by the time you were six. And they also disagreed with Freud about his pessimism, that the world was just going to hell on a handbasket. But let's face it, they haven't had to flee out of Austria to get away from the Nazis and probable death. So they probably had a little bit of a better view of things. One of those people that's pretty famous, you can still get a lot of things on Jung online. Myers-Briggs was influenced a lot by Jung's work. Carl Jung, and he he had his own methods of doing things, uh, but he believed in psychological growth, self-realization, and psychic wholeness. Now, that sounds a lot better than going to hell in a handbasket, doesn't it? He believed that our development extended throughout the lifetime, that we weren't a cooked cookie by the time we turned six. And one of the things that Jung believed in was the collective unconscious, This is an evolutionary and universal set of perceptions that we all have without learning them from society. And he called these archetypes. Archetypes are these mental images that we all relate to. And all of these people thought it was universal. They didn't really look too much at society or culture to see how it happened. He says we have these symbols within us. We have religion within us. We have dreams that tell us things, that these themes are are common to everybody, and that we look for those in life, and when we don't find those in life, it's unsettling to us. So stop and think. I bet there's nobody out there that sometimes, you know, you all know what Star Wars is, right? Or almost anything else that you see on TV or movies. It's like a set pattern. You have a hero. You have the protagonist, the hero, the brave hero. Many times you have a powerful father figure, somebody who's going to tell how everybody how everything should go. Many times you'll have the innocent child and the nurturing mother. This is this is like watching Star Wars. You've got the hero. You've got the innocent princess. You've got the force. All of these things. Anything you watch, there's a guy in a white hat and a guy in a bad hat, and they're all fighting in the in the pure innocent female has to be saved. He says that these are things we look for naturally. And if you read or watch movies or even TV shows time and time and time again, you see this pattern repeated. He also talked about something called the shadow. This is the repressed side of our personality. These are the things that we have experienced or the negative or bad things that are hiding down in us. The shadow is the scary part of us or the scary part of life. So this collective unconscious is evolutionary. It's universal. These are mental images. These are instincts. They are in everyone, according to Jung. Now, he had a couple of terms that everybody should know, anima and animus. And when we looked at gender development, anima is being female and animus is being male. And Jung is going to say that we are almost born with the stereotypes, the knowledge of how to be female and male. When we talk about symbols and religion and brave heroes and all of these kinds of things, it's a little bit mystical, isn't it? Can you see us putting this into an experiment 
No, I didn't think so either. An experiment could give us scientific cause and effect, but this doesn't happen with the psychoanalytical people. In fact, Jung is almost kind of mystical and woo, what's out there? But one of the things he gave us that we still use today every day and in all those uh, personality profiles you took uh, is the example of introvert and extrovert. According to Jung, introverts draw their power, their energy, from spending time more or less inside their own head. Introverts don't need as much stimulation as extroverts do. We live inside of our heads. Extroverts, on the other hand, draw energy from being with a lot of people and a lot of stimulation. Now, if you're an introvert, you know that being in a large group of people almost saps your strength. I find myself sometimes at big parties and I don't know a lot of people. I'll just go to the bathroom for a while, lock the door and read just to get myself back on balance. But for extroverts, being by themselves for too long depletes them of energy. They they just need it. It's, it's like hooking up to the battery for them. So most of us are somewhere in the middle of that, I'm sure, by the time that we are out of our, you know, duck and cover flu routine that I'll just be ready to go to the stadium and watch a ball game or something. I'll be so hungry to be with people. Jung gives us a lot that we use in today's world. Karen Horney is also one of the neo-Freudians, meaning new Freudians. New Freud studied with Freud, admired Freud, believes that there are unconscious drives that push us to be the way we are in life, but hers were entirely different. With Horni, and I know it's spelled horny, but it's Horni, okay? Don't laugh too hard. Um, She's the one that said men have womb envy. Remember Freud said that we women had penis envy? She says, no, 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 no. You guys are jealous of the fact that you can't bring life into the world. Let's face it, you only have to be around for one event, and that doesn't even have to be particularly long. And shoot, then we grow the baby, we give birth to the baby, we can nourish the baby, and you guys are jealous of this. Well, Minby, so you go out and build tall buildings and create great art and all of that to try to be as sufficient in the world as females. Well, when we look at how personality develops, so with Horni, psychological disturbances that she says that can mess us up or develop our personality in a different way are relationships. It's not sex. It's not aggression. It's relationships that go bad that cause us anxiety. And she did believe in anxiety just like Freud did. He had his stages where those needs had to be met or anxiety was created. Horni had anxiety as well. She has three different patterns of anxiety. And I think it's pretty easy if we think about people in our lives to see examples of these. The three patterns to defend against basic anxiety for people, the first one is move toward others. Now, the key word here is excessive. We're human beings and we are designed to want the company of others. But some people just take it to an extreme. It's excessive. And you know who those people are. They text you 20 times a day. They want to know, what are you doing? Where are you going to go? Can I go with you? Da, 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 da. I mean, they're just those people that want to be glued to you. I, I find that really troubling for me. I love to have a close friend or a few close friends, but I really don't want somebody that's so clingy. Ugh, clingy people, they just text you to death and they're in your life and they don't observe your personal boundaries. They have this excessive need for your approval and for affection. Then there are the people that move against each other. And this is excessive. These people have an excessive need for power. They want to control you. They want to, where are you going? No, don't do that. What are you doing? All right, I'll do that with you. You you see this sometimes in parenting. You see this in parents that won't let go of their children once they're adults. You see this in relationship partners that want to tell you everything from Can you go have an evening out with your friends? Can you change the color of your hair? Can you buy a different car? People just wanting to control each other. They have this 
this excessive need to control other people. And I really don't like those people. To tell you the truth, I have a tough time with authority anyway. Probably came from the fact that I grew up in such an authoritarian family, but I, I love my job where I have freedom. I've always liked a job where I traveled out of town. I just got tired of the travel. I always liked a job where my boss was about a thousand miles away or had enough confidence in me to just let me do my own thing. And then number three, there are people that move away from others. They have an excessive need for independence and self-sufficiency. And to be honest with you, I find myself in this group. And in remarrying seven years ago, we've had our anniversary now, I've had to learn and practice being with somebody else, giving someone else their 50% or 60% of the situation as well. Not asking permission, but at least saying, "I'm, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, or discussing things and we make a joint decision I was single for 13 years, and I liked it. And before that, my husband and I both traveled, and we lived very independent lives. And so when I married this time, I almost had guidelines about, okay, this is this is what I do. This is what you do. Poor Bob. I'm, I'm, he suggested really well. And I try really hard because I understand that something in me says I have to be able to stand alone. And you may find yourself that way as well. Mm, I have friends, but not a lot of friends. Love my husband to death. I wouldn't trade my marriage for anything, but I'm still pretty independent. Now, when we look again at healthy personality and flexible balances of needs. I have to realize that these views from both Horni and Jung believe that there are different roles in society for males and females. Men may have their womb envy. They achieve through work. Women have may have a little bit of penis envy or power envy. Uh, so we achieve through raising successful children and doing that. But this, this thing of psychological growth and achievement is basic to human nature as far as Horni and Jung both believe. And these are positive things. Well, let's take a look at Alfred Adler a little bit. Adler broke with Freud. He developed his own theories, and he gives us this concept of inferiority and superiority. These fundamental motives, he says, are striving for superiority, that we are born feeling inadequate. And well, let's face it, we are inadequate. Somebody has to uh, take care of us for a very long time. And he says that this feeling of inferiority is universal. We compensate for real or imagined weaknesses. And if you stop and think about that, don't you think that this kind of matches up with Eric Erickson's industry and competence stage that's in uh, five to 12 year olds, this superiority? versus the ability to do things. He has taken what Freud talked about as the necessity of zero to six on up into middle school where we learn competency. And if we don't learn competency and this sense of being sufficient in life, it can mess with us the rest of our life. If we develop an inferiority complex, it's going to mess with our careers. It's going to mess with our relationships. We're going to have that, I can't do this, I've never done this, I won't be able to do it. Our self-efficacy, our belief in ourselves is hampered when we have inferiority. Now, some people have a superiority complex, and these folks are no fun either, to be real honest with you. They just think that they should rule the world, and everything they do is right, and their way of doing it is right, and if you don't see their superiority, well, you just don't appreciate them enough. So, overcompensating undercompensating for things in life. This goes with all of these theories. None of them you can put out there for an experiment. Uh, Some people are trying to do experimental research on Freud's theories so that they can get some empirical evidence. But in some ways, some people will just say it's mumbo jumbo or soft science and, and put science in quotes. It's one of the battles that psychology has had to face because so many times, unless we're using behaviorism, we can't measure the result of things. 
When we evaluate Freud in a psychological perspective, we have to look at one thing as the inadequacy of evidence. He didn't keep notes. He didn't show how he analyzed things. He wrote books with the basic fundamentals of of what he believed, but we don't have his notes. We don't have the notes from the times those folks were on the chaise lounge and he was sitting up at the head of the chaise lounge taking notes. We can't objectively assess the data. He had only a few clients, or what he called them patients, only had a few patients. We don't know what his interpretations were. We can just almost look at the results without knowing what the process was. In other words, Freud didn't show his work. When we think about the testability that gives us empirical data, we can't prove or disprove any of this. There's just no way to do it. It's too, it's too, it's like a vapor. It's what he believed. We can't prove he was wrong, but we also can't show that he was right. Now, we have some things that we do agree on now. We agree that much of mental life is unconscious. You and I do things because of the good things that have happened before us and the bad things that have happened before for us. And we think of it as conditioning. But Freud didn't call it conditioning. He just said this: these things were in our unconscious life and we acted because of them. And we do know we have an unconscious life. And certainly we believe now the importance of early childhood experience and that it's crucial for how a child turns out. I wish every family had the ability for one parent to be a stay-at-home parent for young children. I had a hard time putting my children in daycare because I thought nobody would care for them or love them or hug them or kiss them when they had a boo-boo or applaud for them when they had a good thing. And I had to work quite a bit, and I know families do now as well. But boy, if you could if you could figure out a way when you have children to have more time with them, more quality time with them. It's not about buying them toys. It's about playing with them and reading to them. These impulses that children have, children are selfish. Children do want their own way. Whether you call it an id or little Billy's just hard-headed, kids like their own way. Let's face it, you and I like our own way too. We don't always like to adjust to society's roles. So the importance of this varies person to person. Some people are just more amiable, more easygoing, and some of us are bullheaded and stubborn. 